Thank you. Uh, the question is that this House has considered the effect of COVID-19 outbreak on the household debt. Paul May and they found that single parent families are the most likely to resort to short-term loans, a third of them relying upon food banks. The 18 to 35 age group was the most likely to apply for short-term credit and also the most likely to be rejected. And only half of those in financial difficulty had actually made contact with money advice providers. £90 to obtain a debt relief order is a burden on those who are already in debt. Now, we welcome a proper government review of whether that truly does represent nothing more than just cost recovery. Yeah, that we will see consensus break out in the House, but I think the consensus is about the need to act. Whether we have different ideas about how we should act may be another matter, but the concern that debt has been the quiet winner of the COVID crisis, I think, is widely shared across the House, and the two excellent previous speakers reflect that. Because the talk of people saving more may well be true, but we know in our communities many people are drowning, not waving. And frankly, they were already in deep water before this pandemic hit. The two previous speakers have given some excellent statistics about the levels of debt within our country. I'm very mindful that Step Chain tell us that over 19 million adults have experienced a loss of income during this pandemic, and 11 million people have built up 25 billion pounds worth of arrears and debt, not because they've been sat at home ordering consumer goods to entertain themselves, but to pay for essentials. As we know, those debts are not equally distributed within our communities. It is particularly those who are renters, particularly those from minority ethnic communities, and frankly, particularly women and mothers in particular, as the Women's Budget Group research shows, that have borne the brunt of this debt crisis that is building up in our communities. We've always had an economy that is increasingly reliant on consumer debt, and we've always had millions of people for whom that reliance is toxic. And as we know, and the member from Makerfield set it out so well, it's very expensive to be poor in this country. For securing today's debate. Being British, we don't tend to talk much about debt or money issues at all. I showed an early interest in the subject, explaining to my first primary school teacher that my parents were worried about their overdraft. I think my parents were most surprised to have the discussion at school. But debt, in whatever form, is a worry. I have direct personal experience of it and of the invaluable support available from charities such as Step Change and our churches through organisations such as Christians Against Poverty. I have a maths degree, yet when I lost my business, I still needed help to sort through creditors, understand which bills really were essential, properly sort out my budgeting and get my finances back on track. As the pandemic has progressed, our understanding of exponential growth has also improved. One suspects that this is the same growth of both the number of our constituents in debt and the level of debt they carry. I already have constituents being evicted because of the level of rent arrears, and with literally no temporary accommodation in North Devon due to the surge in holiday lets, the nearest accommodation is up to 100 miles away in Bristol. This is clearly unacceptable, as local people will be uprooted from their communities. Debts have built up where rent or council tax has not been paid, and through credit cards and overdrafts used for everyday items to make ends meet. Far too many families do not have savings for a rainy day, and the pandemic has been positively torrential. Up. And whilst I have heard and understand all the arguments as to why the £20 temporary uplift to universal credit will end in September, I hope that the Minister will have some explanation as to how families who already cannot make ends meet with it are supposed to when it goes. For many families, if they are unable to work, the uplift can represent 20% of their total weekly income. How many people have household budgets that will tolerate a 20% drop in income? The pandemic has already produced a health crisis and the debt crisis it is generating cannot simply be brushed away by us hoping everyone can work their way out of it. Many can and will, but debt accumulates. The impact on your mental health is devastating but the relief of a resolution is immense. I did not become an MP to see families in my North Devon constituency and across the country become destitute. Leveling up in my mind is about ensuring that everyone in every community has a fair chance to get ahead 
and that our economy raises the standard of living for everyone. Without a clear COVID recovery plan that tackles the household debt balloon, our ability to recover economically from this pandemic will be in peril. Firstly, for immediate support on repaying council tax and rent debts, the Jubilee Debt Campaign and other organisations have advocated for the provision of grants directly to households to help clear rent debts and council tax. To say we have to put this in the political context. A series of regressive government policies will drive this debt and poverty crisis deeper. It's already been mentioned, the scrapping of universal credit, but we've had the freezing of the income tax thresholds from next April, the 5% council tax rise this year. And if you're on a minimum wage or a public sector worker, your pay rise this year will be below inflation. So leaving people worse off in real terms. So it's no wonder that many of my constituents are, have their lives plagued with insecurity and stress. And it's leading many of them, to be frank, to mental health crises. Uh, unsustainable debt destroys lives, marriages, couple relationships and causes misery to families up and down the country. And as in so many areas of life, prevention is always better than... Now, the United Kingdom stands as a real outlier internationally in that so many people who start their lives in an entry-level job end their lives in an entry-level job. If there is to be the kind of COVID recovery that we all want to see, then it must be a recovery for all of us. We have a real opportunity to use the experience of this health pandemic to look again at how we do things, how we deal with the glaring inequalities that we all know exist, how we can be more... Because we've got to be more ambitious than just trying to recreate what went before. If Build Back Better means anything, it means tackling some of these problems and building something that really is better for the future. And that's what we've got to do, starting with this. We have a shared desire to tackle problem debt and a shared understanding that this complex issue can't be wished away with quick fix. Now, the government has responded to the crisis with one of the most comprehensive economic plans in the world. I reject the assertion that this is, uh, somehow means that there is a degree of complacency. And, and the Minister, there have been many good um, initiatives put forward, but I still think there is a lot more we can do. We don't want the debt crisis to turn into another symptom of long COVID with a long debt crisis. And so we need to turn this into an opportunity. And there are opportunities in this. There are opportunities to remove the shame from debt. There's an opportunity to look at the causes of debt. And there's an opportunity to look at creative solutions.